Sometimes in the land of tech, tech enthusiasts will do whatever it takes to get value for money. And right here in my hand, I'm holding two different CPUs that are actually laptop CPUs where they've modified the ball grid array. That's ones that are previously soldered onto the actual uh, motherboards and they've taken them off that ball grid array and attached them to an adapter to then fit in to a desktop motherboard. And now my son over at, uh, he runs the YouTube channel Linus Tech Tips. He actually did a good video on this exact topic. However, in today's video, Linus's dad, that's me, I'm gonna be taking a look at different CPUs available on the market, especially one which catches the eye in terms of price. And that is the six core 12 threaded engineering sample known as QCNT. This is six cores, 12 threads, and it's on the eighth gen process, which means it still has pretty much the same IPC to the likes of an i5 10400F. So six cores, 12 threads for under $70 shipped worldwide. Is this going to be a good deal? And then we've also got another CPU, the 8700B. This one comes in at $166 roughly, and it's again, six cores, 12 threads, but you're probably wondering, well, Brian, if they're both eighth gen, six cores, 12 threads, what's the point in paying the extra $100? Well, let's answer all those questions and put these CPUs to the test to see how they perform in games and also against some popular six core, 12 threaded CPUs out there on the market. Right off this sponsor spot. Do you feel like this when you see this? Well, if so, you can get rid of that Windows activation message with today's video sponsor, SCD Keys, for as little as $12 USD. After you use that coupon, BFTYC, you can get activated today. Links in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. And this right here, well, actually, these right here are six core, 12 threaded options that do have a little bit of a barrier in order to get working. And that is first thing, you will have to get a custom BIOS from the seller for your motherboard. And once you've got that BIOS, you can then install it and you should be good to go. However, it's not all that easy in that the sellers will recommend a lot of the time using a Gigabyte motherboard. And the reason for this is because the Gigabyte motherboard is easy to update and that you just get the custom BIOS from the seller and then you go into the BIOS and then you just simply update and then put the laptop CPU in and you're good to go. However, on other motherboards, it may not be as easy, especially if you're on an ASUS motherboard and they have BIOS protection in place, then you may need to forcefully flash the BIOS with an external clip and program. And there are a few adventurous people in the reviews of these CPUs that have done just that, but I wouldn't recommend this for a beginner. So when I was doing the research for this video and picking a particular motherboard, I then decided to go on eBay and I found a Z370 HD3 from Gigabyte and I purchased that for a hundred Aussie dollars shipped. And when I got this board in, I then had an i3-8100. I used that to flash the BIOS and then we are now good to go. However, there is another step involved in getting these BGA 1440 laptop CPUs to work on an LGA 5X motherboard. And that is you will have to take off the actual clip that holds the CPU down initially and then install the custom bracket that they include with the CPUs when they send them out. So here's where you'll need a hex screw bit and then you can screw that down on three sides and your CPU will then be ready for your cooling solution. However, there is one more important thing to note and that is it's direct die cooling. Usually with your desktop CPUs, you will have an integrated heat spreader. And this simply just protects the CPU from damage because it is very easy to damage the die on a CPU. For instance, even just a hairline scratch on this die right here can mean the difference between it working and not working. So you do have to be very careful when you are dealing with these, especially with your cooling solution. The brackets included with the CPUs should help to mitigate that. So after you get these CPUs to work, you can then begin the process of tuning them, which I do highly recommend in order to get the most out of both. Now, the difference between these two is that one will come up in the BIOS as an 8700B. That's the actual CPU that was released to the public. This one, however, here, the QCNT, will show CPU 0000. 
And in fact, in Windows, it'll even show up as a Xeon. And the quadruple zero code actually means that it was a very early engineering sample. So depending on the motherboard with the cheaper variant, you may come into some very odd issues from time to time. However, personally, upon gaming on these CPUs and then testing them out, I didn't actually come into any issues except for the QCNT early engineering sample where it was displaying 1333 megahertz essentially you double that for your effective ddr4 memory speeds where it showed 2666 but it was actually locking in the xmp profiles where the intel extreme utility would show the true memory speeds and on that note using the itu program will save you a lot of time if you want to overclock and play around with voltages to get the best possible out of both these CPUs. Though speaking of tuning and clock speeds, here's where the most important difference comes between these two CPUs. And that is the QCNT, the $60 option, that will come in with a maximum all core speed of 3.3 gigahertz. Now you can slightly raise this if you wanna raise the host clock, but usually I don't play around with the host clock because it will usually introduce some very odd errors that'll happen from time to time. So I usually suggest leaving this at 100 megahertz just for peace of mind. That is the default setting. Now the QCNT will also single core boost this 4 gigahertz and when we compare that to the 8700b that will go 4.6 gigahertz single core boost and it'll taper off to 4.3 gigahertz all core speeds though i can already hear the cries out there show me the gaming benchmarks show me how these two cpus perform and that'll of course tell us if these cpus are worth the money or if they're just a forget type of cpu so let's move into f1 2020 1080p testing with an rtx 3080 and we've got the competition here which is a ryzen 5 2600 ryzen 5 3600 and a 10 400f and now these five cpus in the results here we can see the f1 2020 the 60 dollars variant doesn't do too bad i was actually quite impressed with how this cpu was performing though contrasting that to the i7 8700b for that extra hundred dollars i just think you aren't getting a hundred dollars more worth of performance especially when we compare it to the other cpus in the bunch which don't require any modding or any special motherboards to select though under for honor we're seeing pretty much a similar trend as we did with f1 2020 and that is that the 8700B, even though it's performing better than the QCNT, you're not getting your $100 worth. But the $60 option is still throwing out very good frame rate numbers in absolute terms. And I feel like if you're on a budget and you wanna play some games coupled with a cheap graphics card and you've got the motherboard there, then this is certainly gonna provide some good value. The move of the Shadow of the Tomb Raider, both these six cores had no problems with juggling over 100 FPS. And then on to CSGO, this was the actual weakest performance of the 3.3 gigahertz QCNT. Here's where the clock speeds mattered the most in this particular game, scoring the biggest difference in FPS versus the other four CPUs. Then what about productivity at this price point? Here's where the six cores all perform really well, but the productivity advantage will go to the Ryzen CPU. Though the QCNT, if we look at that $60 option, is still gonna get you to do light productivity, especially if you wanna edit some 1080p videos and whatnot, and you've got that cheap motherboard lying around, then it's definitely gonna be one to consider. Though with those numbers aside, it's time to wrap things up for you guys. And here's where I'm gonna be picking one winner, and that is the QCNT, and one loser in my opinion, that is the i7. 8700B. Now, I will say, if you want to get a cheap i7 naming variant in some of your flips, if you're flipping a PC and someone desperately wants an i7, even though a i5-10400F is the exact same thing, then this might be worth your consideration. But in terms of me, if you were going down that route, you might as well go for the i9 variant, which we will be doing in a separate video very soon, where they're the ninth gen laptop CPUs that offer even better value if you're willing to pay a bit more than the 8700B. And this is where I'm gonna say that there's another one coming up that's also six cores, 12 threads, and overclocks higher, and I managed to get that to 4.7 gigahertz. So even though that's an engineering sample, that'll be able to clock higher and give you more performance, and it'll cost you around 50 less dollars than the 8700B. So there it is with the 8700B. I'm not willing to pay the i7 tax, and I don't recommend you do either, but then we're left with the QCNT. This one right here offers six cores, 12 threads of pretty much all the way up until 10th gen IPC. 
and it also comes in with the option of using lower power. And so what this means is that you can now use a cheap H310 motherboard, cheap uh, budget cooler, even the stock Intel cooler will do the job with this thing because even in Cinebench R20, the max I saw this thing go to was 60 watts usage. So it's an efficient CPU with an efficient price tag as opposed to the A700B, which also uses up more power. I managed to uh, view the power consumption of this at 4.3 gigahertz all core. And in games, this was going to around 60 watts. And then in the R20, it was going just over 100 watts. So it will use more power and you may need a better CPU cooler if you decide to go down that route. So in a nutshell, the QCNT 6 core 12 threaded budget banger is a great CPU, especially since it's shipped worldwide. You can get this thing shipped for 70 bucks. And at this price point, it does offer a really good value proposition, especially if you're living in a country where CPU prices are out of control from out of control governments taking your money and inflating it away. <laughs> Though it is important to stress if you are able to get one of these CPUs or you're seriously thinking about one, I would suggest securing the motherboard first. Again, you've got the choice of 100, 200, or 300 series motherboards, but the Gigabyte ones offer the most ease of access in that they're easy to update from within the BIOS themselves. Some of the other motherboards from ASRock, MSI, and especially ASUS, they may require some external flashing, which may bring about a lot of problems and frustrations of their own. But if you do see a motherboard going really cheap and you know someone has got that board working with one of these CPUs, then it can offer a great value proposition. And with all that out of the way, if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, let us know down below, what do you think of these laptop adapted desktop CPUs? Do you feel the same as me? Do you think one's a winner, one's a loser? If not, why? If so, why? Let us know. And with that aside, we got the question of the day here, which comes from Caesarville. And they ask, hey, Brian, how are those OLEDs treating you in terms of burn-in? People always talk about that when it comes to OLED panels, especially when used with persistent images like HUDs, or well, that's heads-up displays, and Windows GUI elements. Love the studio and the channel. Thank you for loving the tech, yes, studio. And the OLEDs, the burn-in, I haven't noticed any burn-in on the two OLEDs. Though that said, I do take very good care of them in that I don't want to have any burn-in. So I have them constantly with the auto power saving features on, and that is if they're left on for a little bit of time, they then start dimming themselves heavily, especially if it's a static image. Though another thing to do with your OLED as well is, is make sure the OLED actual intensity is not set to max. It's like running a car on red line all the time. If you're doing that, do you think the engine is going to last long? But if you're running your car at say 3000 RPM versus its limiter at 7000 or 8000, then it's gonna run for a long time. So the same could be said for most devices out there, unless of course they're designed to just be pushed to the max. But with OLED, it's essentially a heat thing. The hotter those OLEDs are burning, the faster they're going to burn in. So I always leave my OLED intensity, that's the actual brightness of the OLEDs themselves, at 80 and under. So you might even wanna go for 60, Hope that answers that question, and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Also, if you want to check out one of these CPUs, I'll put the link in the description below. Peace out for now. Bye.